everyone. This is my presentation. So um, I'm going to be talking you through the project I've been working on this summer. Um, thank you for having me. My supervisor was uh, Dr. Dimitri Atari. And essentially, in a nutshell, we are looking at um, trying to characterize the habitability of different targets in our solar system. So terrestrial planets, icy ocean moons. And to do that, we derive this um, quantitative method. And essentially, it compares Earth analog environments to specific astrobiological environments of interest on these targets. So um, that's it. And uh, let's uh, get on with it. To begin with, we have to ask ourselves, um, well, how, how do we assess habitability? Um, well, extremophiles, um, they are a good place to start with probably because um, they determine the limits of life. They give us these, bound these boundaries in certain, um, certain environments and certain uh, particular fringe biospheres. So once we have the, the bounds um, or the minimum requirements for microbes, um, that gives us a good kind of starting point. Um, we need to find all the different kinds of Earth analog environments that there are um, and all of the different kind of microbes which could possibly survive there, just to give us a baseline. Um, and then from there, we can work on through literature review and through um, combing through all the data we have, basically just assessing, OK, of these targets we know in the solar system, which could harbor life, how similar, how similar are they to the environments we know harbor life? And once we start with the bounds of extremophiles, then we can kind of focus inward and look at more specific cases for specific microbes and specific environments. And once we've done that, we want to look at developing a method to analyze that um, and perhaps scoring all these different environments on different targets and using that score to say, priority wise, which one of these targets is most likely to have life and which should be um, the first port of call for uh, future space missions. And this isn't the first time that work has been done in this area. Um, the previous work that's been done mainly focuses on individual targets. So um, it's typical that you may just look at the habitability of Venus or um, Enceladus. But it's rare to have a work which focuses on many different targets at the same time and makes comparisons with them and ranks them. So that was one focus of our work. Um, again, I also mentioned that the quantitative part of our work that was really important. Um, so a good reference uh, that we built on was the work from um, Marino et al. Um, their approach was to look at all the different kind of uh, environments that there were um, and then look at four particular categories. So um, pressure, uh, temperature, pH and salinity and use those, um, those factors, those microbial factors to determine um, the boundaries for each of these worlds in terms of, okay, very basically, how close are they to being anywhere near what's required for these microbes? Um, and uh, we essentially wanted to build on that. They did not look, however, at using the, the different regions um, to give kind of a score or to compare that this, this particular environment is better than the other. Um, and we also use statistical and multivariate methods uh, to compare how those different factors I mentioned relate to each other and to add more factors to that list. So which environments did we actually choose? Well, um, we started with our reference environments, so our Earth environments. And um, most of these are ice, bi ice biomes and water biomes. And that's mainly because we tended to focus on icy ocean worlds um, being some of the most likely candidates to, um, to find life in our solar system. We also looked at some, some continental environments and some subsurface environments too to add to our list. Um, we just were trying to, with our research and our, our data collection, try and get a good kind of um, large encompassing scope of as many different types of Earth environments as possible. Obviously, there, there are so many different fringe environments we could have chosen, um, but we wanted to find those which we actually had some kind of comparison we could make um, with our different uh, targets and also which we had data for. And when we kind of did a first level analysis, the next thing we focused on was um, assessing different microbial factors which were essential for survival. 
and seeing what the boundaries for those particular factors were in each of these environments. And we can compare the, the kind of the regions, the overlap of, of these, these regions to give us kind of a sense of, um, on a very basic level, are these even close to being habitable? And then looking at uh, seeing the amount of volume, um, I say volume in, in brackets because uh, this diagram here, it, it's kind of a simplified diagram. It's only in three dimensions. We ended up with um, six and seven factors. Um, eventually it was six, but yeah, that those numbers of factors would mean you actually had like a seven dimensional diagram and a seven dimensional volume, uh, which we calculated programmatically. So um, don't think too much about this, but essentially we're just using that, that overlap of the different regions to compare um, what, our, what we can use for, our, for our, um, our score and how likely it is that these targets are actually habitable. And speaking of the, the factors that we actually accumulated, our research gave us this, this very long list, these, this 20, um, 20 plus list of really important essential um, minimum requirements needed for life. And uh, these fell into the five important categories of water, um, biomolecules, energy, um, and also the kind of the extrinsic factors of the environment and the dynamics, so the, the temperature fluctuation, things like uh, tidal forces. Um, but unfortunately, not all those things are very easy to quantify and to ascribe a particular number to. So we needed to refine our list. And the way we went about that is we took our original set of 20 factors and we uh, filtered them by two particular criteria. Our criteria were, okay, so which, as I just said, which of these factors can we actually give a number to? Um, and um, the second part of that filter, once we refined our list was to say, okay, now let's comb through all the data and find out how much of this data is actually available to us. Um, so by doing this process and going through these filtering steps, um, we arrived at a, uh, a final list of, of six particular factors, and those factors were the temperature, the pressure, um, acidity, UVC, um, the radioactivity, and the salinity. And those proved very useful for um, assessing the habitability of these different targets, and then being able to use that to give ourselves priorities of which was most likely to be habitable. And I've been talking a lot about these different targets, so it's good to give a couple of examples. Enceladus was one of the, the targets that we looked at, and here we can see a table um, uh, of the Enceladus um, data we had for each one of these microbial factors against the different environments we selected. Now on the right as two, you can see uh, the Earth reference environments we used. Um, the, the specific values aren't too important, but it's good to just see kind of a sense of what it was we were comparing. And um, when we were comparing individual factors um, for our analysis, um, we inserted uh, the components that we were looking at, the data we were looking at for each factor and each environment into um, a metric, uh, which I'll talk about in a second. Um, but yeah, essentially, this just gives you an idea of, yeah, we, we are looking at this particular component, this particular factor, and we are comparing it to the Earth analog. And I wanted to note too that um, not all environments uh, are included because um, we had a mixture of terrestrial and icy environments and, for example, Enceladus wouldn't have that terrestrial um, subsurface environment that um, we had in our list of Earth analogs. So this is the metric itself. Um, take a moment to just digest the equation. Um, don't worry too much about it, but um, essentially the metric just works by uh, comparing um, the Earth value that I spoke about and the, uh, the reference value that we're looking at for the particular target. And yeah, essentially uh, the XIJs that we're looking at, those are the particular components. Um, so in this case, this would be the, the Enceladus uh, data point for that um, factor and that uh, environment. And the Earth environment over here in yellow would be the, the XIJ naught, so our bases. We apply this metric formula, which we derived, um, it's built um, on the Earth and the Earth Similarity Index. That's what it's kind of um, how it leapt off from there, but it needed modification for this particular means. And once we insert those two values, we can get um, a cumulative score for each environment 
and then we can use each environment score to give us a total score for the entire target. And once we have those scores, we have one way of, um, of prioritizing or just having a list in order of how habitable each one of our targets are. And then we can combine that with the other data we've collected on the targets individually and some of those other factors which we couldn't apply to the metric, but important things like um, the chemical gradients and bionutrients and things like that um, to give a final list of which of these targets is the most valuable for finding life. And I would like to give some preliminary results as well. Um, these are preliminary, so we are still working on finalizing results, which is why I don't have any lovely plots to show you. Um, but basically, it seems that Mars at the moment from our data uh, is the most uh, habitable. It's got the best overall score, and it also has a lot of um, very high scoring environments. Um, but I would like to make the caveat now that our, our method is very data sensitive. So probably the reason why Mars is the best candidate is for the time being, we have the most data on Mars. We have rovers, we have on-site data, which we just do not have for these other targets. So it is very likely, in fact, that in the future, when we have more data on different targets on-site, we will be able to expand and to find a lot more information on these targets and then their scores may lift. Um, Enceladus uh, actually beat Europa, which was one interesting surprise. Um, and it had the best individual environment category. So um, Mars was the overall best candidate, but for sp specific environments, the hydrothermal vents of Enceladus were the best from the data we have. And as I said previously, Venus was a candidate which is uh, very topical at the moment, and it should have had a higher rank. But again, lack of data and the particular environments of Venus didn't match the environments that we had selected from Earth's, um, from the list of Earth analog environments because most of them, as I said, were kind of icy, icy ocean world environments. And the method works for this amount of factors, um, six factors, seven environments, but it is scalable. And in the future, the more we learn about um, different Earth environments here, different uh, niches that microbes can survive in, and we collect more data on each one of our environments and different targets, we will be able to scale that out. And there is no reason why in the very far future, maybe, uh, when we actually can um, really probe exomoons and exoplanets, we can we can also apply this method too. There's no reason why not. Um, so that's my presentation. And if we have any uh, time left, then uh, any questions would be great. I've left a, a summary there too. Thanks. Wonderful, great job, Todd. Uh, I think we have time for one question. If anyone would like to ask. I see a hand from Sanjoy. Sorry, um, Todd, thank you. Very interesting presentation. Um, in calculating your kind of habitability volume, you have axes of temperature and pH and different uh, characteristics. Um, so pH, as you know, is a expression of the log of the concentration of, of uh, H pluses in the fluid. Um, is it a bit dangerous to mix like linear axes like temperature with log axes like pH? Yeah, um, we, for, yeah, okay. Um, do I have a lot of time to answer this or I'll just keep it short? <laughs> it's a good question, very good question. Um, yeah, basically uh, we did have to, the metric isn't as simple. This is a, a nice simplified version of the metric, but it, in the end, we did have to kind of go in and um, fiddle with a few specific quantities. As you said, pH was one of them. Um, and yeah, it, it did take, um, some stuff under the hood where we had to kind of uh, rearrange the logarithms and and yeah, it, I would say, I wouldn't say it was dangerous, but um, we did have to consider it and it was something we had to fix because uh, the method wouldn't work unless we did make some of these um, adjustments. Another adjustment is um, zero values as well, um, causes problems and also the changing number of factors. And there were a lot of considerations like that, but. We, we did manage to incorporate pH properly, and I personally was the one who sourced that, so I'm, I'm confident that we managed to get that working properly, yeah. 